Hello, so my name is Olivier Chan, and I'll be talking about representing the possible trauma and representation in Alfredo Chavez Rwandan project. The aim of this paper is to discuss the relation between trauma and representation in a work of Chilean artist Alfredo Jara, born in 1956, mainly his installations dedicated to Africa, in particular Rwanda. Uh, we should take a closer look at how the artist engages with atrocities, in particular genocide. We'll examine how his installations both provoke and disarm our own voyeuristic gaze which so often underlies our engagement with the spectacle of atrocities. I shall argue that the artist toys with the mechanisms of trauma, reprogramming the shock dynamics and substituting the aesthetics of the wound with the document, which I understand as the contextualization and integration of image and event. In the document, the post-traumatic gaze is both revived and buried, acknowledged and mourned. In the time and space of the document, the viewer can finally encounter, engage with, and be present in the missed encounter of the traumatic event. In order to set up the document, Alfredo Jara contextualizes the image by recreating a unique environment and public space, which collapses traditional separations between object and subject. The view is not external to the work of art or to the fabric of history, but integrated within the frame of the image, often through the use of mirrors, where the viewer becomes a participant within a historical frame of the event staged by the artist. Alfredo Jara thus expands the double surface of the document by developing time as well as space in order to set up a specific spatio-temporal armature um, type barrel in line with the historical event captured in the frame of the image. In the document, the event becomes an architectural space which can be experienced and visited by the viewer. One such work of art is The Sound of Silence. The Sound of Silence contextualizes the infamous Pulitzer Prize winning Kevin Carter photograph, first published in the New York Times in 1993. Uh, it shows us a child starving on its way to a feeding center in Sudan under the hungry gaze of a vulture. Instead of telling the story of the little Sudanese girl whose fate is unknown, Jean focuses on the man behind the famous image on what happens behind the frame. The Sound of Silence sets up the space of the image in a large cube. One of the external sides of the cubic structure is illuminated by a series of blinding white neon lights, violently contrasting with the dark interior of the cube. It takes eight minutes in a small camera obscura to understand and experience the multiple and interwoven tragedies of the Kevin Carter photograph. The story of Kevin Carter unfolds in writing and silence on the screen. The biographical narrative of the South African freelance photographer is a narrative of failure, soul searching and trauma, which enables the viewer to identify and empathize with Carter, who sadly committed suicide in 1994, age 33. Kevin Carter's narrative culminates in the traumatic encounter with the starving little girl in the Sudanese bush. The cruel subtext lies in the fact that Carter waited 20 minutes watching the little girl call in desperation in the hope that the vulture would spread its wings, which it does not, in order to get a better picture. The text is only interrupted once by four violent and blinding flashes turned against the viewer. The violent breach of the scopic field reverses the position of the viewer, voyeur, now violated by the flash and victimized like a Sudanese child. Carter's picture then appears furtively on the screen and the narrative ends the destiny of the image and suicide of the photographer. The image has only appeared for a fraction of a second, the actual time it took for the image to be recorded, but the frame of its cruel history and destiny will haunt the viewer throughout the rest of the visit. The Sound of Silence manages to stage what Stanley Cohen called the atrocity triangle, which he understands in the following way. In the one corner victims to whom things are done, in the second, perpetrators who do these things. In the third, observers, those who see and know what is happening. As Stanley Cohen further remarks, these roles are not fixed. On the contrary, they often exchange and rotate amongst the participants of the atrocity triangle. The sound of silence collapses the separations between the three figures of the atrocity triangle. 
The photographer as witness is a perpetrator, a predator like a vulture who is waiting for the right moment to strike. But he is, of course, also a victim of his own photograph. He never forgave himself for not assisting the little girl. The ghost of the little Sudanese victim has altered the memory of Kevin Carter until his death, thus turning into a kind of mnemonic monster. The scopic cruelty which sustains our own voyeuristic gaze as witnesses is violently inverted and thrown back at us, and we find ourselves all of a sudden um, on the receiving end of the people, abject and stained by our own voyeuristic gaze mirrored by the screen. The sound of silence is trapped for the post-traumatic gaze, stages and disables the very mechanisms of scopophilia that work within the atrocity triangle. The image enjoys the site of trauma with its violent breach of the subject's protective shield, which disrupts the psychic order. The dramatic nature of the image is particularly present in this Rwanda project, which explores the remnants of the Rwanda genocide. In 1994, a few weeks after the end of the genocide, Jean leaves for Rwanda, where he takes some 3,000 pictures. He spends a lot of time in the company of victims debriefing survivors. It then takes him six years to process the material attempting to do justice to events and encounters which on many levels cannot be understood nor represented. I quote, if I spent six years working on this project, it was trying different strategies of representation. Each project was a new exercise, a new strategy, and a new failure. Basically, the serial structure of exercises was forced by the Rwandan tragedy in my incapacity to represent it in a way that made sense. It is this failure of representation, undeniable when it comes to traumatic visual culture of atrocities, that John seeks not only to show and expose, but to bring about in the radical interface articulated by his installations. In his visual and material strategies dealing with atrocities, Jaws made a point to avoid the too easy and banal trappings of empathy, which are inevitably attached to the pathos of visual suffering. Thus disarming the compulsive identification of the victim which drives the viewer face with representation of atrocities. This gesture recalls Claude Nozman's approach to the Holocaust, where the scandalous images of the genocide itself were discarded and the simple narratives of those involved privileged. Instead of the horror provoked by the sight of mutilated or dead bodies, the view is caught and trapped within the historical nature of the document. Real Pictures is an installation where Jean's Wonder pictures are not visible but buried and entombed in black boxes. Every box bears the factual description and narrative of the photograph, and the visitor is overloaded with a narrative of genocide which contrasts the minimalist aesthetic arrangement of the scene. The image buried in its box tomb is transformed into a document where the image is suppressed and the narrative exposed. One of the narratives reads as follows. Kutete Emirita, 30 years old, is standing in front of the church. She was attending mass in the church when the massacre began. Killed with machetes in front of her eyes by her husband and her two sons. Somehow she managed to escape with her daughter and hid in a swamp for three weeks, only coming out at night for food. When she speaks about her lost family, she gestures to corpses on the ground, rotting in the African sun. The boxes are piled onto each other, monumental mass graves of various sizes and heights, but also archive, transforming the museum, and museum space into a mausoleum in place of memory, where Jean's Rwandan photographic experience rests. Real Picture is an obsessive monument dedicated to a traumatic encounter between an artist and witness and the people of Rwanda. Real pictures is a sign of mourning, not only for the victims of the Rwandan genocide captured in the images, but also for the artist's own private Rwanda. In a gesture similar to Claude Nozman, who said that he needed to resuscitate the anonymous victims of the Holocaust and kill them a second time in order to accompany them, 
Jean revives and buries his traumatic memories, never abandoning them. Alfredo Jean, through the document, resurrects, objectifies, and engages with the archive of his traumatic memories. In real pictures, the traumatic memories both acknowledge and mourned, laid bare within the Rwandan archive. The document, as it appears now, also works as a tool and a weapon against trauma, in the sense that the psychic reality of the event is not denied, but acknowledged and richly buried, a healing gesture which mirrors the work done by psychiatrists working with victims suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, who are answering psychological debriefings to factually document the genesis of the traumatic event. While his Rwandan installations are serialized and obey an obvious logic of compulsive repetition, real pictures is an attempt to ward off and lay at rest the post-traumatic content of his Rwandan photographic encounters. The most haunting work on Rwanda is probably the eyes of Gutete Emerita. In the eyes of Gutete Emerita, the viewer is not directly confronted with the atrocities of the genocide, but is faced with the eyes of Gutete Emerita, the gaze of a survivor whose narrative has been mentioned earlier, and who has been a direct witness to something it is impossible to bear witness to. The aporia of the eyes of Gutete Emerita is that there is a fundamental disjunction between a narrative of trauma which can be told but not represented or can only fail in representation and her gaze which has witnessed the genocide but is unable to show it. Uh, this disjunction is also present in field, road, cloud where the legendary beauty of the Rwandan countryside does not show any wounds. Trauma etymologically um, signifies wound nor signs of the atrocities which have taken place. Jean once again manages to disable and to disarm the viewer's coprophilia by refusing us the obscene side of the wound, which is in a way refused by Gutete Merita and even by Rwanda itself. Alfredo Jean confronts the viewer's desire and need to see the traumatic wounds with the survivor's need to be the Rwandan landscape for Gutete Merita to live beyond the event. The uncomfortable view is left with the impossible task of searching for traces of a horrifying event which was once there but is no longer present. The traumatic gesture is a returning and a revisiting of the event. This is what the viewer both attempts and fails to do. The traumatic nature of this missed encounter is indexed by the hundreds of thousands of serialized signs of the eyes of Utete and Marita heaped upon a white neon screen. The traumatic white neon screen, so present in the work of Alfredo Jarre, indexes the emptiness and excess of absence, the excessive and violent white pain of the absent. The post-traumatic gaze of loss, like the buried images of real pictures, is here again sculpted into a mass grave or funerary heap, laid bare within a blinding field in a gesture which attempts both to revive and bury at the same time. The powerful and haunting nature of the eyes of Kutete Merita lies in the shaming gaze of this missed encounter, which is not only a missed encounter between John and the subject, but a missed encounter between the West and Rwanda. What Alfredo Jean manages to conjure within the space of the museum is the very experience of our failed engagement with not only certain images or realities, but also the very political fabric that makes those realities possible. In Untitled Newsweek, Jean displays all the Newsweek covers that appear during the unfolding of the Rwanda genocide. Every cover is accompanied by the historical facts pertaining to the genocide and its monstrous body count, which every week added up another 100,000 additional unreported and anonymous victims. The reality of genocide is absent from the Newsweek covers, which focus instead on, in comparison, trivial Americana, such as the deaths of Kurt Cobain, Jackie Kennedy, the trial of O.J. Simpson, and the high-tech gender gap. It is only in August 1994, after the end of the genocide, that the first Newsweek cover dedicated to Rwanda appears. 
What the art of Alfredo Jara tells us is that we have to move away from scopic trappings offered by the sight of traumatic images, which show and excite but do not explain. The spectacle of these images is costly from a psychological perspective. The excessive and overbearing presence of the traumatic image will trigger a process of impossible denial. It will hold the viewer in return until they are dealt with, that is acknowledged and mourned. The other danger is apathy, an excessive response similar to shock and also related to trauma. Apathy is when we're no longer able to respond effectively to what we are shown when we become inured to the pain of others. The document provides an alternative to the scopic trap of atrocities and to the PTSD shock apathy continuum by fostering acknowledgement and providing an interface with the missed event of which the sign of the wound is crucially absent. Instead of the negative ontology of trauma, the art of Alfredo Jarre has relentlessly sought to awaken and affirm a positive ontology, that is, a compassionate ethics of presence, a political consciousness oriented towards being present to those who most need our assistance and protection. Thank you very much.